So with that, I'm going to uh, bring in my good friend, uh, John Radell. John, good Charlie, to see you. Good to be with you. And we're here to talk about the Faith and Freedom Coalition. So, so tell me a little bit about yourself, and, uh, and then we'll get into Faith and Freedom Coalition. Well, I uh, worked for about 15 years at DuPont, and then uh, left DuPont to work on a nonprofit for a couple of years, and then went into business with my wife and started our own little small business, which we operated for uh, about seven years. Uh, both retired and both uh, work at the part-time at the Wilmington Senior Center to help out our community. Oh, nice, nice. And what do you do at the Wilmington Senior Center? I'm the resident services coordinator. I, they have 18 apartments, and my responsibility there is to take care of the residents in the apartment, make sure mm -hmm. they have what they need, that, uh, that they get to their medical appointments on time, that they have the care they need, and that everything's okay at the apartments. That's great. That's great. So uh, you, a, a couple of years, well, a, a little over a year ago, I guess, you, you, you looking around at the landscape, looking around at Delaware, and uh, um, you're, you, you have very strong faith. I've known you for a, a little bit, and you've got very good, strong faith. And, and you said, you know what? Our country is moving the wrong way, and more importantly, at a local level, our state and local communities moving the wrong way, and we're making judgments that are not based off of uh, good moral, um, uh, ethical decisions, background. And, and so tell me a little bit about that. Well, that's exactly right, Charlie. My wife and I have been involved in politics and the Republican side of the party, but even there, we felt that there, there wasn't a real focus on what made this country great. And you, when our country first formed with our founding fathers, they saw two key parts, the faith part and the freedom part, the, the political part. And our founding fathers wisely binded those two together because they realized together it, it was a strong dynamic force that would make this country great and did. Uh, unfortunately, over the last 30 years or so, um, there have been movements in this country that tear those pieces apart. Now, although faith can stand on its own, our country un is unable to stand on its own when you remove the virtues and morals and ethics of the faith-based uh, philosophy. So, conference in Washington, D.C., found out about Faith and Freedom Coalition, uh, found out that faith was the first part of that equation for them, and we said we found a home. This is where we need to be. Came back to Delaware and, and formed the Faith and Freedom Coalition here in Delaware. And, and so, what have you done? Well, we, we are, have I've organized a group now. I think we're about 480 strong in Delaware and growing. Uh, and we're a group of uh, faith-based individuals, small businesses, and everyday citizens who are looking to promote sound public policy based on traditional values of faith, family, and freedom. Now, I, you know, I, I, and, and I've been involved uh, at, a, at, at, at a board level. You've, I certainly have done, frankly, almost nothing. You've been doing uh, all the heavy lifting, you and, and, and some of the folks that work with you. Uh, and, a, and a couple weeks back, you had a, uh, had a, uh, a, a prayer conference uh, on, uh, on a Saturday morning down at the riverfront and, and only organized it over about a six-week period of time, it would seem to me. And, and 500 uh, or so people, I mean, it was, it was oversubscribed. You, you had to stop letting people in. Um, tell me about Tell, tell, tell us what that, what that agenda was. What were you trying to, to do there and what did you do there? Well, the first thing we wanted to do there is not to promote Faith and Freedom Coalition as an organization. Uh, we felt there's been a tremendous move away from the faith-based philosophy. Uh, so what we wanted to do is give a forum for the pastors to then present what they believe Prayers for America should be. So we selected some local pastors, Pastor Chris Rue from Word of Life Church, uh, Pastor Bill Schleinecker from Bible Fellowship, Pastor John Betts from Abundant Life, Father Tom Flowers from uh, St. Polycarp, and they brought in a pastor from Louisiana, uh, Pastor C.L. Bryant, who made a documentary, Runaway Slave, which I believe everybody should watch. It's coming out June 19th. And we said to them, they asked me, you know, John, what do you want from this event? And we said, what we want are people to leave that event, disciples of Jesus Christ and defenders of the Constitution of the United States. And other than that, this is yours. And those pastors put together, I, I believe they were all touched by the Holy Spirit, they were put together a form and a format that was absolutely ast astounding. I mean, they really touched the hearts of what prayer is about, what faith's about, how we live our faith, how we have to vote our faith, and how we can't separate our faith from anything we do, including the public discourse. Uh, you know, uh, a, a good friend of mine, uh, uh, Pastor Chris Bullock of, uh, of uh, Canaan Baptist Church, once said to me, because I'm, I'm an Episcopalian, and, and I like to, to say that uh, we Episcopalians are very dysfunctional Catholics, uh, but we put the fun in dysfunctional. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, 
uh, Dr. Bullock once said to me, well, Charlie, you know, the, the Episcopalians, you're the frozen chosen. And, and our, our services are very quiet. <laughs> But, uh, uh, and, and, and as a guy that actually loves uh, gospel music and blues, um, mm -hmm. you know, going to, to some of the uh, uh, African American and evangelical churches uh, really gets me going just because I love the music um, and the message. But I was, uh, some, of these, some of these guys can flat out preach. I mean, it was a, it was a, great, uh, it was a great morning. It was a tremendous morning. And I, and I think that what, what more and more of us are starting to see that you know, returning to our faith, returning to the roots of our faith and, and the true meaning of our faith. And I'm Catholic, but I don't care whether you're Catholic, Protestant, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Methodist, it doesn't matter. We're all, the, it's all the same God. It's all the same teaching. It's all the same Bible. You know, and unless we work together and unify ourselves in that philosophy, then we're, you know, we're going to allow government, we're going to allow individuals to separate us away from what we truly believe. Uh, the question I would ask is, is politics today pulling us away from our alliance to the Ten Commandments? You know, are they teaching us to covet other people's goods? Are they teaching us to bear false witness? I mean, we really need to take a hard look as where we are as Jews and Christians in our society and how we're going to conduct ourselves. The true judge is, is up there, not down here. Well, you know, and, and, and you, you, you talk about our political world today and what's going on, and, and, and I look at it and, and the, uh, the health care bill, which is often referred to as Obamacare, and it's in the courts and everything else. The health care bill was longer in pages than the Bible. So we can get the entire message from, from God and, 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 and the Son Jesus Christ, and yet we can't figure out how to handle our health care system in fewer pages than that. And then if you throw Dodd-Frank and the financial regulation, which bailed out all the banks and created uh, frankly, a, 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 a mechanism in which they are not accountable. They're, uh, they're going to be able to fail again, and they will fail again. And for those folks who are on a fixed income, who are living off of interest income, and you're looking at that interest and you're saying, there's no interest payments here because rates are so low. The reason rates are being kept low is so that the government can keep debt funding and the banks can rebuild their balance sheets. So you want a fixed income who you've seen your fixed income getting eaten alive. It's because we're bailing out the banks still and we're bailing out all the spending being done to the federal government on your backs. And this whole that Romney and Warren Buffett really isn't going to fix that. And, and I'm not arguing that, that everybody shouldn't uh, put a hand on the, on the oar, but, uh, but the bottom line is holding our interest rates artificially low is, uh, is destroying uh, the, the, the middle class and those folks who are on a fixed income who've worked their entire lives and have earned that. Um, but uh, I know I'm digressing to an economic <laughs> issue, but it is faith and freedom, and freedom is talking about economics. But well, um, It is, sorry, but there's even something more insidious happening here. If you look what the administration has done uh, to the Catholic Church, <clears throat> they have effectively closed every Catholic orphanage and uh, adoption center. They, they shut them down, and they shut them down by the laws that they created and forcing them to adhere to things that are going against their faith. Well, now they're working on the Catholic churches. I mean the Catholic uh, hospitals, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And the Catholic hospital serves one in six of everybody that goes to a hospital. And m the majority of Catholic ho hospitals are in the inner city. So who gets hurt the worst by that? It's the, f the poor that gets hurt the worst by that. So these philosophies and these attacks on religion are really undermining and hurting the poor more than it ever hurts the middle class. Mm -hmm. And that's the insidious part of this. Uh, a abortion in the city, uh, in the state of Delaware, uh, is so high now that the birth rate in the African-American community is less than 2%. It's 1.85%. In New York City, it's 0.95%. That means that to sustain any society, you need a 2.1% birth rate. They're so far below the birth rate at this point because of these policies. So it's not replacement level. That's in, right. In other words, it, if you, if for, for, for every uh, adult or every couple, I guess, you've got to have to have 2.1 kids because of accidents and that kind of thing that, that, right. uh, to get to two, and that keeps you at a stable population. Right. And, and if you go below that 2.1 number, you start, the population gets smaller. It's getting smaller and smaller, and, and like I said, in Delaware, it went from 2.4 down to 1.85 and dropping. And it's dropping at the rate it did in New York, where now well, it's point nine five. Well, that comes out of some, honestly, out of some of the uh, the, the the beliefs of uh, of some of the environmentalists and things like that. That there are too many people, that the population of the world is growing too fast, and we're going to use up all the resources, and and it's going to be death, dismemberment, and destruction uh, over time. And yet, 
every time anybody's ever made those Malthusian predictions, as they're called, because the first guy that, that did it that yep. was popularized was a guy named John Malthus, mm -hmm. those predictions have been proven wrong. Uh, and a matter of fact, uh, there's, a, there's a guy that works at, uh, in Denrec in the, in the state government who used to have a blog called Tommy Wonk, and he came out and he said, oh, you know, natural gas prices are going to go up and, and, and this is going to be terrible for Delaware. That's why we've got to do these other things and spend money on all this. Well, natural gas prices went from $8 uh, down to $2 because of technological innovation from the private sector. And so when, uh, when, when people, and, and populations do slow down as people become wealthier. Mm -hmm. And it requires more energy to raise children, get them educated. Uh, and so the populations naturally slow down. And as we've watched countries come up the economic ladder because of cheap energy, mm -hmm. their population increases have slowed down. And so being at 2.1 to 2.4 keeps you on a good number to keep a good stable population, good workforce and, and, and economic opportunity for people. When you drop below that, you start to vanish. Well, you do, and I, I think that the two things that are under attack now are economic freedom and religious freedom. And they're the two, two most key points for anyone to have a solid foundation in life. Uh, and when you, when you remove those two things, you remove basic freedoms from individuals, then the government moves in, and what you're doing is losing your power, losing your individual strength, and losing your individual identity. And we're, Faith and Freedom Coalition is here to say enough of that. Uh, you know, we're going to get involved in the public discourse. We're not going to allow... Uh, our religion, or our faith to be eroded. We're not going to allow our freedoms under our Constitution to be eroded. It's time we stand up together as different people of faith, of different people of color, uh, as one nation, one faith under one God. And so what are your action plans for 2012 and beyond? Well, for 2012, right now, we're going to educate uh, individuals what's happening in our country, what the real issues are and how those issues impact them. We'll be putting out issue guides over the next six months so people can understand truly what the issues are. Uh, then we'll be putting out voter guides so people will understand uh, where the candidates they support or oppose stand on those issues. So that you can actually start voting your freedom and voting your faith and understand the dynamics of that. We're going to be involved in the community, helping the communities as well. That's also part of our uh, charter as, as an organization. We definitely want to be in the community helping citizens understand things, educating them, teaching them about financial uh, solvency, how to, how to maintain a budget. Those are the issues we want to do over the next year. Going forward over the next several years, we want to make sure we grow our organization so that we can reach in every church, so that we can give the pastors the ammunition they need to discuss these issues in their pulpit, from their pulpit, to bring people of faith together to understand the importance of their voting and how they vote and why what the, how their vote affects not only their faith but affects their daily lives. So that's what we're going to do over the long term. I mean, I find it fascinating that the, the First Amendment to the Constitution says Congress shall make, make no laws uh, abridging the free exercise of religion each. The Congress shall make no, no law abridging the free right of speech. And yet, uh, there are laws that say if you are a pastor and if you're in the pulpit and if you say, I disagree with this politician, that you then are putting your church at risk. When those were two of the most fundamental freedoms built into our, uh, our, our, our basic rights right from the start. Well, if you look at the First Amendment, it's speech, press, religion, right to peacefully assemble, and the right to petition the government. Mm -hmm. So you remove any one of those five, you can start removing the others as well. Right. And then the dynamics of who we are as a people change. So and we have to guard those, those freedoms. And really the first person to institute the church, that, uh, the church not being able to speak, was uh, Lyndon Johnson. Yeah. When he was running for office, a couple groups went against him. He didn't like that, so, so he shut him he down. Went, he shut him down. Yeah, and, and if, if if the government is starting to tell you what you can or can't say, and in what areas you are allowed or not allowed to say it, all of a sudden government starts controlling speech. And and uh, there's a great quote from uh, from Stalin, one of the most vicious, ruthless uh, murderers in the history of mankind, who ran the Soviet Union, Russia for for years at, uh, around the World War II, he said, ideas are much more dangerous than guns. We don't let our citizens have guns. Why would we let them have ideas? And that is what you're doing. If you shut down the ability for a pastor or anybody else mm -hmm. to say what they want when they want to say it, you, by definition, are trying to shut down the, uh, the exchange of ideas. And I'm free to listen to your idea and say, I think those are wrong. Mm -hmm. And, and to assume that I don't have the ability to make that decision on my own is, uh, is, is a gross 
statement in my opinion. So um, how would somebody get involved? Well, the, the way you can get involved is you can go to our website. Uh, it's www.deffcoalition. And we've uh, been running that on the ticker, so. Dot com. Uh, you can send us an email, sign up to, uh, you can get an email there. You can also sign up to volunteer and get involved. If you want to be involved in your churches, uh, for pastors, if you contact us at that address or at, at our uh, email address, which is uh, faithfreedomdelaware at yahoo.com, uh, we can provide you the information you need to know what you can and can't say from the pulpit, what you can and can't do from your church. Um, you mentioned uh, C.L. Bryant. Uh, very briefly, and and uh, I know he was at uh, the Prayers for America <laughs> breakfast, um, and and he's got a documentary coming out. He's out of out of Louisiana. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the message that he gave? Uh, his message was quite simple: that, that uh, if we allow ourselves as people of faith to slide into a liberal philosophy and a liberal psychology of how we conduct our lives, then we're surrendering our life to that philosophy instead of taking control of our life. Uh, and I would recommend, that it's called Runaway Slave. There's a website, uh, Runaway Slave. Visit the site, uh, look at the film, and listen to the message. It's a clear, honest message about what's happened to the African-American community. And he's trying to re reinvigorate the strength of the community through developing small businesses and, and increasing the wealth of that community, helping the poor. And that's uh, C.L. Bryant's philosophy. My, my, and on this show, I've said this many, many times, and so people who have watched the show before, I'm sure have heard it, but I, I have a fun, fundamental philosophy that, that is the best person to take care of me is me. Mm -hmm. But I do need two things. I need an education, and I need a job opportunity. And I talked about the education numbers here in the city of Wilmington and what the charter schools are doing with less money versus the district schools. And I've talked a number of times we're talking here about how job opportunities, especially in the city of Wilmington, with government shutting down the ability of people to, to start a business and controlling what they're allowed to do and not allowed to do, and what that's done to the economy. Uh, because if I can't make money from my assets, I've got to work for somebody else, or I've got to go stand in a line for the government to hand me something. And, and we continue that path, we're in a lot of trouble. We've only got a, a, a couple of minutes left. I don't know if you have one uh, last thing you'd like to get across. I sure do. I, 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 faith Freedom Coalition really does support the charter schools, and we think faith-based schools, that the dollar for, tax dollar for each student should follow that student. So that student's not forced into an education system that doesn't fit their beliefs, but rather uh, are put in an education system that really adhere, or supports their beliefs and their support system. So we would encourage everyone to support a charter school bill here and that the tax dollars follow the student. Great, great. Well, we've been talking to John Riddell and the Faith and Freedom Coalition, and uh, we've been showing the, the website and all up on the screen. So I hope you go check out their website, see what they're about. Um, it, it, it really is about how we get reinvigorated in our faith and use that faith to help drive public policy. Uh, the, the, there's been a disconnect and, and, frankly, a misread of the separation of church and state. The separation was that Congress shall not dictate what religion you or anybody else uh, can practice. But it never said that faith should have no role in government. Because faith is what, it, it, it's the moral underpinning that defines uh, and, and describes what, 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 what your decision basis is going to be. If there isn't a core fundamental set of philosophies and beliefs, then any decision is okay. There's no moral underpinning. Uh, with that, this is Charlie Copeland, and this is the end of the